Welcome, everyone. Today is June 30th, 2021. I'm Trey Dobson, Chief Medical Officer at Southwestern Vermont Medical Center and an emergency medicine physician with Dartmouth Hitchcock Health. And this is Medical Matters Weekly, a show about the aspects of healthcare that matter to you most. Um, you can submit your questions on Facebook Live, and we have received some questions ahead of time at our website address, which is wellness at svhealthcare.org. My guest today is one of my colleagues in the emergency department. I'm so excited to have Dr. Nicholas Weinberg here. He's an emergency physician at Dartmouth Hitchcock and a member of the organization's Wilderness Medicine Fellowship. Uh, he's on faculty, and Nick, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, it's a pleasure. I'm excited to be here. Where Where are you right now, actually? Uh, I am at home. I live in Orford, New Hampshire. Yeah. Oh, super. Yeah. Well, again, thanks for joining us. Just a little bit about Dr. Weinberg. Uh, he has a medical degree from UVM, so he has the Vermont uh, connection there. He did residency in emergency medicine down in Albany Medical Center, so just down the road from, from Bennington. Uh, did a fellowship in ultrasound, which is radiology at Massachusetts General Hospital, uh, and lots of other things, and in particular, this wilderness medicine. So he worked as a wilderness EMT instructor. Uh, he's in the process of completing his fellowship in the Academy of Wilderness medicine. And his field work has taken him everywhere. It's so exciting. Every time I work with him, I hear about a new place around the world that I, I want to go to, but probably will never get to, uh, from the Peruvian Amazon to the Everest a region of Nepal, Indonesia, South Africa. We can talk a little bit more about this uh, as you get to know Nick. And uh, we're so excited to have you. So just start off and tell us a little bit about uh, you know, your earlier years in life and how you got into medicine in the first place. Yeah, so I'm actually from New York City originally, um, but I was always drawn to the outdoors and wasn't really ever cut out to be a city person. Um, so I basically spent my youth trying to get out of the city, and I always loved to travel a lot. And I was drawn to outdoor activities, uh, hiking, climbing, mountain climbing, skiing, paddling. Um, and I did a lot of other jobs before medicine for many years. And I actually took seven to eight years off between medical school and college, where I was a ski bum, a ski instructor, ski patroller. I worked delivering sailboats to the Caribbean offshore. I worked on several tall ships um, as a sailor professionally. Um, and then I worked as a mountain guide in the Alps and Alaska. Um, and I kind of lived in a pickup truck, living hand to mouth and, uh, <laughs> things were, things were, were fun, but it, you know, I was always kind of, uh, kind of looking for the next adventure and never sure when my next paycheck would come in. So I decided maybe I should join the real world eventually. And, uh, I was climbing with a good friend of mine who was a captain of one of the boats I was working on. And unfortunately we were involved in a pretty bad climbing accident and a bunch of rock fall um, happened and he actually severed one of his uh, fingers and his hand got crushed. Mm -hmm. And I was almost killed by the rock fall. And I had an epiphany, I had just taken a wilderness uh, first aid course for guiding basically. And I had minimal uh, medical experience and uh, I had treated his injuries, evacuated him, tied a tourniquet around his arm. We grabbed his finger and we left the, the climbing area and eventually he got his finger reattached and he's still climbing and sailing today. And I had an epiphany and decided I wanted to go into wilderness medicine. Um, so I went to a wilderness medicine conference in Colorado um, with no experience. And most of the other uh, providers there were, were emergency physicians. And I asked many of them, you know, can I do this? And they said, yeah, sure. Go into emergency medicine and you can work part time in an ED and part-time traveling and doing whatever you want, ski patrol, whatever it was. Um, so that's kind of what I did, and it's kind of been history since then. That's, that's God, that is, yeah. you've lived more just in a couple of years of life than most of us have, have done our entire lifetime. It's not an uncommon story in emergency medicine that people were involved in outdoor activities, and that's what drew them to doing uh, emergency medicine. And um, me, I'm the same way with the climbing and, and being outdoors. Although I, I must say you've traveled quite a bit more and I would love to live vicariously through your, I mean, your, your activities there, you started off, it sounded like several books I have read, uh, <laughs> both fiction and nonfiction. So yeah. it's great. Um, and, and, you know, when you were at that conference, did you actually have doubt that um, being a physician, that you were capable of going in and being a doctor? That's what sometimes uh, yeah. inhibits people. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, it seemed pretty intimidating and unlikely. 
Um, but the, the, what happened was many of the people I met, they just seemed, especially the emergency physicians there, they just seemed like ordinary people. And I kind of realized, oh, if they can do it, I could probably do it. Right. So that helped, I think. So then, so have you lived up to that? You work in the emergency department at Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center as, as an academic physician, teaching residents, uh, seeing uh, stuff that comes to a, a uh, trauma center and, and level three or four um, uh, tertiary care center, quaternary care. Do you get outside now still, or are you stuck yeah. in the emergency department? Yeah. So, so, you know, I still, I, one of the reasons I like living where I'm living is because there's great access to outdoor activities. And, you know, we have a pretty flexible schedule that, that affords a lot of time to recreate. So I still definitely get out to climb and ski, hike and things like that. Um, my kind of roles have shifted. You know, I started out um, my first three years out of residency. I worked in a busy community hospital in upstate New York um, in Plattsburgh um, mm -hmm. at CVPH. And um, one nice thing about community medicine is that they, they were quite flexible with my schedule and I was able to take large blocks of time off um, anywhere from one to three months. Um, so for, during those uh, first three years, I did several longer kind of expeditions. I worked in Nepal for three months um, in the Everest region. And I worked on a, a tall ship that sailed a traditional square rigger that sailed across the Indian Ocean from Bali to, to Cape Town. And that was about three months. Um, so one nice thing, if you're really interested in this type of field, community medicine can can allow you it's in the right place to, to take larger amounts of time off. Now, um, you know, I have uh, three children and I'm, I have an academic position at Dartmouth. And so my, my roles have changed a little bit and it's, it's a little bit more challenging to take larger blocks of time off now, but hopefully I, I will still kind of do it in the future. Right. And you still get up to Romney and other places around New Hampshire and Vermont. Yeah. And yeah. It's a great, if you're a climber, it's a really a great area to be. Explain to, so we're going to get into some of the medical aspects so that people um, have a little better idea of what you do when you're on, um, uh, when you're a physician, actually, or in, in, in medical uh, profession and on an expedition. But let's start off with one of the questions that I'd, you know, sort of provided earlier. What is the difference between the terms like wilderness medicine, mountain medicine, expedition medicine? Are there any differences? Yeah, that's a great question. And actually, it's such a good question that I'm I've actually did a grand round on just this topic. I actually presented at UVM last year, and I'm going to present the same talk um, to our grand rounds in March, if, if anyone's interested. Mm -hmm. And uh, be basically, so many people come up to me, either asking me what exactly is wilderness medicine, or how do I get involved in wilderness medicine, is a very common thing that people come up to me asking about. So I created a talk kind of describing the history of wilderness medicine, and what it is, what it isn't. And... Yeah, so it's, it's kind of an amalgam of multiple different fields that have joined over time. It's kind of like more like a Venn diagram, I would say, with kind of multiple separate fields, and there's still some overlap. Right. And the one big overlap seems to be that it's kind of austere or resource poor, and that you just mm -hmm. don't have all the resources that you would have in you know, a busy, developed emergency department. Right. And we can imagine that as, as emergency physicians. And also the public should be able to imagine that too. You're in an emergency department, you've got access uh, to a defibrillator, to intubation equipment, to certain medications, uh, but you're just not going to have as much access. Although there's been some progress um, made in, in that. Can you talk a little bit about some of the progress as far as technology, portable technology in the field? Yeah, I mean, uh, one, one big thing is ultrasound. And I also did, a, as you mentioned, a fellowship in ultrasound um, in, in Boston several years ago. And one of my goals in doing that fellowship was to apply ultrasound into these resource poor settings, whether it's developing countries or wilderness settings. And the ultrasound is probably the best example of how technology has helped um, advance this field. Um, Basically, the, the, the technology is getting smaller and smaller, and you can now plug in an ultrasound probe essentially into an iPhone or a tablet, a smartphone, um, and take that in your backpack in the middle of nowhere. And people use solar panels. Solar panel technology has improved significantly lately so that you can charge these devices um, away from a power source. So for the audience that are, are not uh, physicians uh, or in healthcare, what do you use an ultrasound in, in the mountains and the wilderness for? Yeah, so m many people 
many lay, lay people, when they think of ultrasound, they think of, you know, OB obstetrics and looking at a baby. And uh, there's a, a really cutting edge field called point of care ultrasound, especially in the emergency department that, that we basically use ultrasound in real time as an extension of the physical exam while we're examining patients. You can image most parts of the body with ultrasound, whether it's the heart, the lungs, abdomen, um, even the eyeball. Um, so there's a lot of applications for ultrasound now. Uh, and so in resource poor settings, whether it's in a wilderness setting or a developing country where you just may not have access to advanced imaging, such as x-rays, CT scans, or MRIs, there are a lot of applications with ultrasound. So you're in the mountains, someone gets a rock that fall to the belly and you can put the ultrasound look up the, to the abdomen and say, Hey, is there any bleeding? Do I need yeah. to helicopter this person out or can, exactly. we, can we, right. So that's, yeah. and that's huge going from a big ultrasound machine that most people are, are used to seeing, like you said, at their, at their appointment to see their baby uh, in the belly. And then now the size of an iPhone and just a little plug-in is yeah. remarkable and should really be adding to, um, to the outcomes, to positive outcomes. In people. Yeah. Yeah. It really, it really helps in, in wilderness settings. You're often not doing complex procedures. Mm -hmm. You're really making a decision of whether you want to evacuate a person or not and how you want to evacuate them. Do you want to call a helicopter? Can they go on a horse? Do they need to be carried by other people potentially risk, you know, putting others at risk? So that's usually, that's often the big decision you're making in wilderness medicine, whether you evacuate or not and how you do that. So let's talk about your time in, in Nepal then. So what was your actual role? Yeah, so I worked for an organization called the Himalayan Rescue Association, uh, which is a nonprofit uh, based in Nepal and Kathmandu. It's also affiliated with several physicians in the United States. And it's been around since the 70s, um, basically, uh, when trekking and climbing became popular in the Khumbu region, which is the Everest region, um, they were finding that lots of trekkers, climbers, and especially porters, um, we think of the Sherpa people being having these genetic adaptations to altitude, but many of the porters on these expeditions are actually from the lowlands and they lack that genetic adaptation and they're, they're doing it for money and they know very little often about altitude. Um, so they, they just found lots of people getting very sick and dying totally uh, unnecessarily just from lack of education. So the organization was started to educate um, and also care for the, not just the trekkers and climbers, but also the local population in these, these regions. And th this is a region where you can only get to by taking a terrifying flight <laughs> into the mountains and then several day walk on a narrow footpath. So it's, it's extremely remote. Now there is more and more helicopters that have access to this area, whereas traditionally you'd have to be carried out basically. Right. And you still, the, the helicopters still have difficulty. Of course, there's the weather aspect, which yeah. is uh, horrific, uh, but still reaching those tall, tall altitudes. Yeah. And you have to, so when you would work there, when you're working there, then um, I'm sure you had a few days off to go uh, enjoy the mountains yourself, but yeah. would you be in a, in a sort of a base camp and field people that came in? Were you on the radio, all those things? Yeah, so we there's a there's a very basic clinic in this town called Ferrache, which is at about fourteen thousand feet, um, mm -hmm. and it has pretty minimal resources. Um, and that's the area where that elevation is where people really start to get sick from things called hape and haste, which are the two primary diseases um, that can really harm people and kill people at altitude. Which is one is fluid in the brain and one is in the lungs. Um, right. So, so that, just ex explain those out real quick, the, uh, what the acronyms stand for. for the Yeah, so, so HACE is high altitude cerebral edema, which is a fancy term for basically fluid in the brain. The brain swells up when there's, the oxygen is too low. And you can basically be, have anything from a mild headache to being in a coma and death at the extreme ends. And then high altitude pulmonary edema is basically the lungs with low oxygen don't like it and they get inflamed and you get fluid that builds up in the lungs. And you Many can Many people in the audience are, are probably have seen something on TV on a National Geographic show or at least talk to someone and have maybe not familiarity with those terms, but the understanding that you can get altitude sickness and those are the extreme ends of that altitude sickness, including in lower um areas not necessarily in nepal but even in parts of the u.s although it's much less less common 
Yeah. So you deal with that, but I assume you, you had to deal with other things, uh, pneumonia and things that people present to you in, in an emergency department in, in New York or, or in Dartmouth with as yeah. well. Yeah. I mean, you see a lot of the same things. People come in for common colds as well there too. Right. Um, right. It doesn't matter who you are, where you are, people come in for, for, for more minor things. Pneumonias, um, a lot of gastrointestinal illnesses, diarrhea, parasites, things like that in travelers and trekkers as well. Mm. Um, we also saw quite a few blood clots. It's controversial, but um, there's many people think that you're at increased risk of blood clots at high altitude. And we had a, a couple of very sick patients. We had one patient that had a cardiac arrest from, from a large pulmonary embolism, which is a blood clot in the lung. Um, so there were definitely some sicker people as well. And you're trying to manage that. I mean, of course, I have the advantage of seeing a couple of your talks and seeing some of the slides, but you're trying to manage that just so the audience understands this in a clinic that does not look like a hospital that we are used to. This looks more like not a barn. That's a little bit of an extreme, but it's, it's, it's a room. Off, right, right. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty basic. And then um, are you able to treat, it sounds like a, a certain percentage of those people and then get them on their way back up to whatever they were doing. Uh, but others, are you calling that helicopter on a daily basis? Yeah, sometimes. Sometimes there, it's, it is on a daily, like in the busy trekking season and the busy climbing seasons, they're often daily evacuations by helicopter, unfortunately. Wow. Yeah. Most, the nice thing about altitude illness is that fortunately, most people do very well if you catch them and treat them. It's very easily reversible, um, which is a nice thing, unlike many of the other conditions we treat on a daily basis in kind of developed emergency departments. In the sure. Front. Talk a little bit about, um, because people do read this, uh, a little bit about the medical therapy. And I know there's, you know, controversies on prophylaxis, but um, you don't have to talk about that. But what are you recommending now when people are, are in the mountains? For prophylaxis or... Yeah. For both, just you can talk about whatever you, you your opinion is and the current literature. Um, altitude or? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so the, the most important thing for altitude is is to, to just go slowly. Um, and, you know, we're in that area in the Kumbu region of Vermont. Uh, sorry, not, <laughs> Nepal, not Vermont. Um, uh, you know, there's a standard ascent schedule that we recommend for most people. And there are always some outliers that just have really or luck, but the vast majority of, of climbers and trekkers, if they follow that schedule and go slowly and take enough time to ascend, they don't get sick. And almost all of the patients we see who do get sick, they ascended too rapidly. There's mm -hmm. all, always some outliers that were just unlucky, but the biggest thing is just going slow and listening to your body and not forcing things. Um, if you are going to take medication, it still really hasn't changed much in recent years. Um, acetazolamide, also called Diamox, is kind of the the main, the mainstay for prophylaxis. Um, and then dexamethasone is a steroid that can also be used as prophylaxis, but usually it's more for treatment, uh, especially that high altitude cerebral edema that we talked about earlier. And I'm sure you get people, they, they want to cut those corners. They, they aren't able to uh, use all that time because they have other commitments in life and they want that medicine. And I imagine you, you steer them towards, you've just got to take uh, the, the proper precautions ahead of time. Um, what else do you see out in, in the mountains? I assume you see some trauma. Yeah. So I also worked on Denali and Mount McKinley. Um, I worked for the park service um, on a, a high mountain patrol. So there's patrols on the mountain that are constantly ascending um, at different levels. Um, climbing Denali is a big, it's a, it's a big, a long process involves a lot of time and it's complicated logistics, getting it up to different stages on the mountain. Um, so the park service has a team that is hopefully acclimatized at each level of the mountain to do rescues if needed. And, um, each team has a medical person on them. Um, sometimes it's a physician, sometimes it's a paramedic, sometimes it's a nurse, sometimes it's a PJ or a pararescue jumper. Mm -hmm. Um, so I was, I did two patrols, two seasons on Denali and up there we see a lot of altitude illness, um, but also a lot of trauma as well, falls, um, and, uh, you know, we'll do a lot of helicopter rescue up there, but sometimes if the helicopter can't fly, they have to be manually extracted and carried down to the base camps. Well, wow. and, and then of course, even um, closer to home in the White Mountains, mm -hmm. uh, we see lots of trauma from people falling there and, um, and they actually end up coming to our emergency department at Dartmouth-Hitchcock uh, once they're stabilized at the scene. So I know that's a big part 
Tell me, um, with you know you can't get away without us asking, what's the worst thing you have seen or maybe the craziest thing you have seen uh, in, your, uh, in, in your mountain uh, expeditions and work? Um, the craziest thing, I don't know. I've seen a lot of different things, but I guess one, one particular um, season on Denali, there was uh, a, a, a pair of climbers that, that were on uh, what's called the 16 Ridge at 16,000 feet on this exposed knife edge ridge. And unfortunately, um, I think one of them actually had had high altitude pulmonary edema and they kept ascending and was pretty unsteady on her feet. And she slipped and fell off this exposed ridge and she pulled her partner who she was attached to with a rope down the side of the mountain and they fell about three to 4,000 feet, took a long wow. tumbling fall and then landed in a crevasse. And, um, we heard about it on the radio. We had just come down from high up on the mountain. We we're pretty exhausted, but we, the helicopter couldn't fly because the weather was very bad. And uh, so we had to climb up and over and we were able to, the, our team was able to rappel down several rappels to try to find them. And we couldn't find them um, and assume they were, had died <laughs> right, right. And, uh, from this extremely long fall into a crevasse. Um, and we planned to go do a, a body recovery um, the next day if the weather cleared. And the next morning we were back down at our, our base camp at 14,000 feet at the main medical camp there. And I got out of my tent and I looked up and I see this lone climber coming down that ridge. Um, and I remembered him because I passed them actually the previous day as they were going up. And I knew that that was the other climber. And he actually climbed out of the crevasse and climbed up and over the, the whole, basically, part of the mountain down to us and told us that his partner was actually alive. Um, and she had numerous head injuries and spinal injuries. Um, and then the next day we brought the helicopter in with a long line um, and basically lowered the line into the crevasse and hauled her out of the crevasse. And she ended up doing very well um, and is now basically fine today. So, wow, what yeah. a horrible story with, with a great <laughs> ending to it. <laughs> yeah. Do you see, you know, that was an extreme example, but do you see um, things that, that occur that you wish um, people knew about prior to going out or common things that people do that you, you wish they wouldn't do um, to stay safe? Not, not necessarily even in Nepal, but just a, a, when someone is doing outdoor expeditions. Yeah, I think I think the big thing is to be humble and kind of respect the, the surroundings. And also just like I said earlier, with altitude, listen to your body. <clears throat> if things don't seem right, don't push it. Um, take the right amount of time to go slowly and to prepare um, and just be aware of, of your surroundings and also your be self aware of your own limitations um, and know kind of what you don't know and when it's when you want to turn around or if you're unprepared. Absolutely. And, and um, for the audience here, we're, we're talking about, um, again, not only Nepal, but just standard, you know, hikes in Vermont and New Hampshire. If you get up to altitude, they can uh, get dangerous if the weather changes. So it's really paying attention to that weather change. I know I've gotten close to being stuck up in the Tetons and in other places that seemed so benign as I was ascending, uh, became treacherous as, as I was descending simply because of rain, snow, sleet that changed the conditions. And that can happen uh, around the Green Mountains and the White Mountains. So something to always um, take into consideration. And as Nick said, uh, it's being humble, which can be hard to do when you, when you really wanna get to the top of something for sure. So what's yeah, your next- most, most of the accidents that we see you know, they probably sadly could have been prevented, you know. Right. right. So what's your um, next adventure um, personally, Nick? Yeah, well, I, it's been tough with COVID, obviously. Right. Um, I'm, I'm kind of a travel junkie and I always want to travel to someplace new. And it's it's been pretty challenging with COVID. Um, I am going actually, I like to go to kind of obscure places that are off the beaten path. So I'm actually going to Montenegro, which is part of former Yugoslavia. Uh, in a few weeks to do some climbing and trekking in the mountains. There's actually uh, eight and 9,000 foot peaks there that are pretty rugged. Um, so and I've never been there. So that's going to be my next mini adventure. That's after awesome. That, yeah. After that, I'm not sure what's next. So I'd like to go back to Denali maybe one more season at some point too. 
Well, three quarters of the fun is the planning and, and uh, part of it anyway. So that's great. Are you going by yourself to Montenegro? No, I'm going with a friend. Yeah. Oh, climbing good. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. Well, we are out of time. I just want to thank everyone for joining us today. We have to do a whole nother one of these. We could keep going. Uh, Dr. Weinberg, thank you so much for being on the show. Yeah. Thanks, Trey. It's a pleasure. Um, if people have questions, later questions for Nick, uh, you know, physicians questions about getting into medicine, um, emergency medicine in the wilderness, wilderness medicine, uh, or other staff or the audience has questions, just please send a note to us. Uh, we'll get those to Dr. Weinberg. Uh, I'd want to thank him for coming. I also want to thank Mike Cutler from Cat TV, uh, Ray Smith from Southwestern Vermont Healthcare, and Ashley Jowett from Southwestern Vermont Healthcare. Next week, we will have Dr. Parsonet, who's an infectious disease physician, also at Dartmouth Hitchcock Health, and he's leading the post acute COVID syndrome clinic. So he's going to address how he and his colleagues uh, are working to care for those with what has been now termed long COVID. So excited to have him on the show. Uh, you can send questions ahead of time to wellness at svhealthcare.org. I'm Trey Dobson. Go out and find joy in everything you do, even in the face of adversity. And we will see you next week.